Have you ever wondered if miracle Grow is truly the miracle that it promises? We're about to dissect this fertilizer giant and answer all of your burning questions. Is miracle Grow safe for human use? What about our precious plants? Is it safe for them? Does it harm vital soil microbes? Can our furry friends frolic around miracle Grow fertilized gardens? Do synthetic fertilizers like miracle Grow contribute to atmospheric CO2? And we'll also tackle many more questions. Buckle up for the truth about miracle Grow, where we'll explore the science behind this popular brand and help you decide if it's the right choice for your garden haven. Hi, I'm Dr. Tom Warren, and you're watching The Plant Doctor. Let's get started. I recently came across a YouTube video about miracle Grow that had over 250,000 views, and the channel itself had a huge following of over 1 million subscribers. I'll leave a link down in the description below for this video. This video makes several claims about the use of miracle Grow, and at the end of the video, it left me with more questions than I had answers. So I decided to dive deep into peer review literature to see which statements were true and which statements were false. And I want to share my findings with you. I will also share the links to those papers down in the description below. Let me be perfectly clear. This video is not meant as an attack on the producer of the video that I've mentioned. I have watched several other videos on this channel and there's lots of good information with a thriving community of eager learners. This video is me simply trying to dig into what the published data has to say about the claims made in the video and me sharing my findings with you. The first claim I want to address is if miracle Grow is safe for humans and pets. It is implied in the video that miracle Grow is not safe for humans and we should wait at least 72 hours before we re-enter an area where miracle Grow has been used. This video also implies we do not know what other chemicals may be in the miracle Grow mixture. It is also implied that natural chemicals are safer than lab chemicals and that lab chemicals produce off chemicals that are harmful for humans and pets. Let's first address the statement that miracle Grow is not safe for humans. Every fertilizer used in the United States is required by law to have a material safety and data sheet. The material data information sheet provides exact ingredients for the product. Any off chemicals in the product would be required by law to be listed here in this list. The material and data information sheet also includes OSHA approved permissible exposure limits for all of the ingredients in the product. The data sheet also gives a hazardous identification list that spells out the potential health effects of the product. As you can see, this product may cause eye irritation, skin irritation in sensitive people, diarrhea if swallowed, or aggravate asthma patients if the dust is breathed in. So to summarize the safety level, do not eat, drink, inhale, expose your skin if you're sensitive, and avoid eye contact and you have nothing to worry about. But let's dig deeper into this topic just to be on the safe side and take a deeper look into the ingredients of miracle Grow. If we look at the list of ingredients, it's nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, copper, sulfur, manganese, and a list of other elements found on the periodic table. If we take a look at the essential elements that humans need to survive, we can see the two lists are almost exactly the same. But what about EDTA? Is it safe? Should we be worried about EDTA? EDTA is an agent that helps keep certain elements from precipitating out of the solution when water is added. EDTA is used in a lot of other human applications that includes treating for lead poisoning, heart rate issues, treatment for high blood calcium, and used as an anti-blood clotting agent and a list of other things. You can even buy EDTA as an over-the-counter medication at your local drugstore. EDTA is commonly used and is considered safe. As for pets, I could not find any peer review or government guidelines for pets in miracle Grow. However, I would make the suggestion to keep pets out of areas where miracle Grow has been used until the miracle Grow dries up to ensure that your pets do not lick up the product and ingest it. As for natural chemicals versus lab chemicals, on the left is a urea molecule from nature, and on the right is a urea molecule from a lab. Urea is a form of nitrogen found in fertilizers and is a form of nitrogen that can be taken up by plants. As you can see, they are exactly the same. All of the chemicals found in synthetic fertilizers are the exact same chemicals found in organic fertilizer. The plant does not know the difference, and the human body does not know the difference either. Both chemicals are exactly the same. Another claim I want to address is that miracle Grow can burn or even kill plants if too much is applied. This is 100% correct. It is true with any quick-release fertilizer like miracle Grow. 
You need to read the label and apply as directed to help eliminate the possibility of using too much fertilizer. Constant application of miracle Grow can turn into too much of a good thing, leading to the plant having too much nutrient uptake with detrimental results to the plant. In this video, it is also suggested that miracle Grow can cause increased insect pressure on plants. There does seem to be some peer review to support this. There have been several studies show that synthetic fertilizers have increased pest pressure compared to those fertilized with organic fertilizers, such as manures or compost. I find this very interesting. And I began asking myself questions. How could this be? Is there something in organic fertilizers that is suppressing insects, such as the fungus Bt, that we know is a natural insecticide? Is it because synthetic fertilizers produce higher yields of crops, therefore insect population increases as the yield increases? If the latter is true, this would mean that insect population is not really impacted by synthetic fertilizers on a per yield basis and that the increase of insect population is just a natural regression of increased food in places for the insects to live. For example, let's say on a thousand square foot plot we put down 10 pounds of an organic fertilizer of 10-10-10 and we yield 10 pounds of corn and we scouted 10 harmful insects. Then on another thousand square foot plot we add 10 pounds of a synthetic fertilizer, a 20-20-20, and we have 20 pounds of corn and we scouted 20 insects. This would mean that there's no difference between synthetic and organic fertilizers on a per yield basis, and that the increase of insects is caused more by the amount of food and habitat and not by the fertilizer itself. I searched Google Scholar for several hours looking for a solid paper and could not find answers to these questions. So on the surface level, the statement that synthetic fertilizers increase insect pressure is a valid statement. However, this really needs to be looked at on a deeper level. If you're an aspiring PhD student in horticulture, this would be a great project to dive into for a dissertation. There's simply more questions and answers when it comes to this. Do synthetic fertilizers release CO2 into the atmosphere? Yes, this is true. Fertilizers account for around 1.5% of total CO2 emissions worldwide. However, this is true for both synthetic and organic fertilizers. Organic fertilizers rely on decomposition to release their nutrients. A natural byproduct of decomposition is CO2. I found one paper that indicated that organic fertilizers actually increase global warming potential by enhancing CO2 emissions. The paper did go on to illustrate that these findings are inconsistent due to external variables such as climate conditions, soil conditions, crop type, and other agricultural practices. Further research is needed to isolate these variables for a clear understanding of the relationship between organic fertilizers and CO2 emissions. So do fertilizers increase CO2? Yes, synthetic and organic fertilizers release CO2 into the atmosphere. Another claim that needs to be addressed is that the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico is caused by fertilizer. This is 100% true. Nitrogen and phosphorus loads coming down the Mississippi River are incredibly high during the summer and there needs to be a plan in place to reduce these nutrient overload. The development of a national plan needs to be established to reduce the amount of runoff reaching the rivers and our oceans. The best way to combat this is multifaceted. Regardless of the use of synthetic or organic fertilizer, buffer strips around agricultural fields should be maintained with a healthy stand of native perennial plants. Plants as large as trees all the way down to a thick stand of grasses and sedges as understory plants catch nutrient runoff, preventing nutrients from leaching into the streams and rivers. Slow release fertilizers should be used instead of fast release products like pure urea. In recent years, scientists have developed fertilizers that release their nutrients over a period of months and this aids in the reduction of nutrients leaching into water. The issue with organic fertilizers is that they also leach but not as fast as non-slow release synthetic fertilizers. Organic fertilizers are also usually comprised of manures that can carry pathogens such as salmonella and E. coli. Once introduced into a water system, they can quickly reproduce under the right conditions. Chicken litter and cow manure are a big component of organic fertilizers in my area because it is readily available and it's cheap. However, these organic fertilizers also contribute to E. coli outbreaks in our local watersheds. Ideally, farmers would take a soil test yearly before planting season. They would put down the recommended nutrients in a slow-release fertilizer and have large buffer zones between their farmlands and watersheds. This would help eliminate nutrient runoff and deadly pathogens in the watershed. However, 
there are several limiting factors to farmers with the implementation of this strategy. The primary one being cost associated with soil test and slow release fertilizers. With cost being a limiting factor, the implementation of this strategy usually does not happen and the resulting dead zone and watersheds are the result of an over application of fertilizers that leach into the water, leading to the reduction of dissolved oxygen for aquatic life that it needs to survive. The next topic we need to address is the synthetic fertilizers like miracle Grow kill microbes in the soil. There are lots and lots of peer reviewed articles on this topic and to go over each of them would take way too long to go over in one video due to the sheer number of variables that need to be taken into consideration. However, I will focus on a metadata analysis that looked at peer-reviewed papers from 1990 to 2022. The conclusion of the paper was that nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium fertilizers do not contribute to soil physical properties, which should be a given because they're not designed to do so. The paper goes on to say, and I quote, leftover or incorrect addition of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium fertilizers can affect the absorption and use of nutrients, including the micronutrients. And because it negatively impacts the beneficial plant rhizobacteria, it reduces crop yield and quality. Organic and synthetic fertilizers can affect mi microbial community composition, favoring species functionality adapted to the nutrient inputs and activity, and ultimately enhancing the plant productivity. This would seem to suggest that excessive use of synthetic fertilizers would impact soil microbes, which has been proven. The paper goes on to say, and again I quote, because it is not reasonable to use only organic amendments to support plant productivity since they do not provide high amounts of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, a combined addition of chemical and organic fertilizers could be the right combination, particularly for soils with low nitrogen, phosphorus, and organic carbon contents. The so-called 4R nutrient management program should be implemented, i.e. right source, right rate, right time, and the right place. This could be the correct path for farmers to manage fertilization in soil, end quote. And this is the approach that I take in my yard, the right source, at the right rate, at the right time, and at the right place. I do not use miracle Grow over the entire yard, as it's not needed. I use miracle Grow on potted annuals and annual flower beds in the landscape. I only use a 90 to 120 day slow release fertilizer prill as recommended by a soil test on my turf areas. This ensures I'm only adding what is needed in the soil and I'm not adding to the runoff headed towards creeks and streams in my area. I do not use any synthetic fertilizers on my trees and shrubs because it's not needed. Over the past seven to eight years, I have built up my shrub beds with a mix of fallen leaves and pine straw alternating in the fall with leaves and then in the early spring applying pine straw on top of that. This has built a thriving community of microbes that provide my trees and shrubs with all the nutrients that they need. In the late winter, I do add an organic fertilizer to my tree and shrubs that the microbes begin to break down so the nutrients are available for the plant when they come out of dormancy in the spring. It would seem that the consensus opinion of plant nutrition is situational dependent and is multifaceted. The evidence on miracle Grow seems straightforward. Miracle Grow is safe for humans, is safe for pets, and when used at the right time, in the right amount, in the right place, is safe for your plants and it's safe for the environment as well. Where there are issues with this product is when products are not used appropriately. I hope this video helps you make an informed decision about your garden and landscape. Guys, as always, thank you for watching The Plant Doctor, and until next time, happy gardening.